welcome back to the Investor Coaching TV show. I'm Paul Winkler, your host, talking about commissions versus fees today. You know, how does your advisor get paid? How do they get paid for the work that they do for you? Do they, you know, somebody just magically pay them and they're running a charity? No, typically they got to get paid somehow. And it's either going to be commissions that they charge you on products that you buy, or it's usually going to be a fee basis where you're paying them a fee, maybe an hourly fee, maybe a fee based on the assets under management, something like that. Now, that's what I want to talk about today because I actually got a question. A guy was a financial advisor and he wanted to debate me regarding regarding this particular topic. So I thought, hey, you know, that's actually a pretty good show because, you know, there are people that are out there wondering what's the better way of going about things. And if you look at it, like I said, there are three ways that advisors typically get paid. One is they only receive commissions. Another one is that they receive commissions and maybe fees for things that they recommend. And another way that's maybe fee only. So let's take a look first of all, what are the conflicts? I mean, are there any conflicts of interest that you need to be aware of with a fee based model? And yeah, there, there can be conflicts of interest that you need to be aware of. Number one, I actually read an article about this and because I wanted to see what, the, what somebody that was in a brokerage community actually said about it. And the article was actually written by a broker dealer, so I kind of took that and knew where they were coming from. But here's what they said, and I thought it was interesting. They said, well, number one, you know, if, if your advisor's paid on fees, you know, they're going to avoid recommending charitable giving. Because if you give to a charity, they can't manage that money anymore. Now, technically, I'm going to say that, you know, if you think about it, if you're planning on giving to a charity, you know, whether I think that you're going to, you know, I'm not going to get paid or not, uh, I'm going to tell you you're going to give to that charity. Because if you think about it, you want to give to that charity, why should I stop you or how could I stop you from giving to that charity? So I think it's kind of a weak argument, but that was their argument. Another one, they said, you know, avoid paying off mortgage. You're not going to pay off your mortgage if you are going to fee, fee based account. The advisor is going, oh, no, no, don't pay off the mortgage. And I'm going to tell you, this is actually a real one because I have seen people that go to their advisor and the advisor goes, oh, no, your interest rate on your mortgage is very, very low compared to what you can make with us. And I look at it and go, that's a dangerous position. If a fee only advisor is telling you that, and they're saying it for that you got to figure out whether it's for their reasons or for your reasons. Typically, it is not a really good idea to pay off a mortgage when you're much, much younger. Because if I look at all the 30 year periods in the stock market, the historical rate of return, the lowest historical rate of return in the stock market going back all the way to 1926 is eight and a half percent. If your mortgage rate is three and a half percent, you might be able to make a really good case not to pay off the mortgage. But typically, I'm going to tell you, if an advisor is telling you not to pay off the mortgage and you're in your 50s or 60s, maybe they are engaging in this conflict of interest. Another thing that you have right here is avoid paying off or avoid gifting. They may tell you, you know, when, you, know you really shouldn't gift. I think that's kind of a silly thing. If you're going to gift to your kids, you're going to gift to your kids. I mean, you don't care what the advisor says or what they're talking about regarding your investments. It's not typically going to sway you a whole lot. So I think they're kind of weak arguments really when it gets down to it. Let's look at the other side. What are the conflicts with commissions? Well, you know, the person that wrote this article really didn't talk about this, but they're the same. You think about it, if a person is paid on commissions, they're going to also tell you not to give to your charity. They're also going to tell you not to pay off their mortgage. They're also going to tell you not to gift because now they can't charge commissions on your investments anymore. So kind of a weak one if you, if you ask me regarding this one. Now, what are the other conflicts? Well, number one, they're going to favor higher commission based products. Hey, if I've got one product that pays me a 3% commission and I got another one that pays me eight, I'm going to be hard pressed not to recommend the one that pays eight if you think about it. Now, another problem that you run into is, you know, you might recommend companies that do revenue sharing. You know, a lot of companies, a lot of broker dealers have actual disclosures on their website. If you dig deep enough, you can find them. They'll actually say that, hey, we, uh, we get in revenue sharing if you, rec if you buy this mutual fund over this mutual fund. And they'll have a list of preferred funds that pay revenue sharing to the broker dealer. In, in other words, kickbacks to the broker dealer if you recommend them over their competition. How do you know if that's happening? Well, you can actually find that normally on the website if you dig deep enough on the broker's website.
Then another thing that you're going to find is that they tend to move investments more often. And, you know, advisors were, oh, I never do that. I see it all the time. You know, a person has a mutual fund or they have an annuity and they have an eight year surrender penalty. In other words, you buy the annuity and then for eight years, if you leave, you get hit with a back end penalty for leaving that annuity. Well, guess what? They keep, they keep a database on this, brokers do, and they know when your annuity has come up for a renewal. Why do they call up and say, oh, you know what, uh, I noticed that your annuity's come up for renewal. It won't cost us anything to move it from one product to another. And guess what? There's a better product out there now. And all of a sudden, voila, you have a better product that you can move to, and they get another commission. Very common practice. What else is there out there? Well, you might have somebody that advisor might use non-breakpoint products. You know, they're going to be more likely to do that. A breakpoint is this. If you only put $10,000 in an investment, your commission is this much. If you put $20,000 in, you might have a lower commission. If you go and put $50,000 in that same investment, the commission's even lower. Well, that's a breakpoint. Guess what? The more you commit to the investment, the lower the advisor gets paid based on a commission. So a lot of times what they'll do is they'll go, hey, is there something I can recommend that doesn't have a break point? In other words, the commission is the same no matter how much money you put in there. If there is, guess what they're going to recommend? A lot of times they will recommend annuities for that very reason. Annuities are typically non-breakpoint products. The commission is the same no matter how much money you put in there. Another thing that they might do is use multiple fund companies to avoid breakpoints. You know, like I said, if I commit a certain amount of money, then what happens is my commission goes down. But if I break it up between many fund companies, I'll never hit that limit. And I always pay the higher commission as an investor. And the advisor gets paid the higher commission if they break it up between multiple fund companies. Another common practice. And what happens is you end up, you know, another one that you might do is they may actually recommend a single fund company. Now you got a problem is they're doing the right thing as far as breakpoints go, but now you might be foregoing diversification. In other words, if I put all my money with a single fund company, but they don't have all areas of the market represented, then I don't have proper diversification. So that's another problem with a commission based model. Now, what else might an advisor do? Well, they might not have any incentive to manage a client's investments or keep them disciplined just when they need it most. This is really important. You think about this, you know, you're not going to, why would I go and invest and manage your money 10 years after I got paid? Think about it in other areas of the world. Let's say if I go to a doctor and I pay that doctor one time and you know, all of a sudden six years down the road, there's new medical research out there. There's new equipment out there. There's new medicine out there. There are new techniques to treat your illness. What incentive do I have to bring those to you if you paid me 10 years ago? It doesn't even make any sense. How about the accounting world? You know, let's say if I pay an accountant once and I say, okay, I want you to do my accounting from here to eternity. Why would they do that? Tax law changes, why keep up on tax law changes? Why keep up on anything if I got paid 10 years ago? That doesn't make any sense either. And it doesn't make sense in the investing world. Things are constantly changing in the investing world. Things are constantly needing to be done to a portfolio, rebalancing, making sure that it's re-optimized, making sure that the investments inside internally are the lowest cost they can be. All kinds of things coaching you to make sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot, that you don't move the portfolio around at the worst times. There are all kinds of reasons that somebody needs constant intervention and constant contact and constant help from their advisor. But if you pay that advisor once and never pay them again, what incentive do they have? It doesn't make any logical sense. Tell you what, I'm going to take a quick break. And right after this, I'm going to talk about a securities attorney look at variable annuities. So instead of, you know, me, a financial guy telling you what I think about variable annuity investments and what some of the problems are with them, you're going to hear from a securities attorney, a guy that sues brokers for a living. That and more right after this on the Investor Coaching TV show.